Okay, so today's in today's video, we're going to be going over SIADH and diabetes insipidus. Um, this is part of the pants um, blueprint uh, from the endocrinology topic, and we're following along again with the NCCPA blueprint. And I just wanted to mention one other quick thing. If you do like the content I'm making on YouTube, I also have a podcast under the same name, Cram the Pants, which I feel like will be uh, helpful as well if you wanted to check that out while you're driving down to clinicals or wherever you'd like to... Um, to listen to that, I think it's something else that is pretty helpful. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, so for SIADH and diabetes insipidus, there's one key hormone that's very important to understand. So I want to go over that real quickly before we dive into those uh, diseases, because I feel like if you don't understand this, or at least have a general understanding, they won't make as much sense. So what is ADH? So ADH is uh, also known as antidiuretic hormone. Another name for it is arginine vasopressin. And it is produced by the hypothalamus and stored in the posterior pituitary, where it's actually dispensed when needed. So um, it helps regulate the volume of fluid and in turn the blood pressure in the body by resp uh, responding to the plasma osmolarity levels of the body, which indicates the hydration status. Um, in increased plasma osmolarity, which would indicate a decreased blood volume, which would uh, be a patient that's dehydrated, it's going to cause the pituitary to increase the ADH levels, which uh, the ADH signals to the kidneys that, listen, the body's volume depleted right now, we're dehydrated, go ahead and conserve, absorb more water, don't let any of this fluid go, we need to conserve all that we can. So ADH is essentially a hormone that tells the kidneys, preserve the fluid, bring it back into the body, don't release it in the urine. Um, and that's a general idea of what ADH is. One other thing I also wanted to touch on in addition to ADH, this is just a quick diagram you can see here. So as the plasma osmolarity increases, indicating a dehydrated status, um, the ADH will increase in production, which is going to increase water reabsorption, which again is going to go the opposite route, now leading to plas decreased plasma osmolality, and then eventually uh, decrease your ADH release, and then we go in this continuous circle, which is maintaining the... Um, the homeostasis in the body as far as as far as fluid levels so that's what adh is one other thing i want to touch on because it can be a little bit confusing if i don't go over this is uh, serum osmolarity so serum osmolarity is the amount of chemicals or solutes dissolved in a solution in the body we'll be talking about both the urine and the serum the blood um, and the more liquid in the solution relative to the amount of solutes or chemicals the lower the osmolarity so an easy way to remember it is it's opposite to the amount of fluid in the serum. So if you have a large amount of fluid relative to whatever amount of solutes you have in the actual solution, it's going to indicate that this is going to be a low serum osmolarity. So it's going to be the opposite. So if you have a small amount of fluids, that compared to the same amount of solutes is actually going to be a high serum osmolarity. So opposite of the amount of fluid in the serum, it's more related to solutes compared to the liquid. Um, so let's talk about something that has low serum osmolarity. For remember, it's the opposite of the fluid. That would mean that this has a high volume of fluid in it. Um, so it's increased fluids relative to the solutes. Serum is watered down, essentially. Um, and then the opposite as well would be high serum osmolarity. So if it's high serum osmolarity, it has a small amount of fluids, meaning the same amount of solutes is relatively higher compared to something that has a lot of fluids. So high serum osmolarity would be decreased fluid in a serum, serum relative to solutes, and the serum would be more concentrated. So just a quick diagram that I made, not a great job, but I'm just trying to get a general idea picture here. Uh, so something with high serum osmolarity, remember small amount of fluids. If you look at a cup here, this would be a cup that's only a quarter of the way full. So it has all these solutes on the bottom and it only has a small amount of fluids. Um, so these, these, these solutes, these chemicals that are in the solution are pretty potent. This is a pretty concentrated or high serum osmolarity because there's a small amount of fluids. Now, if we compare that to something with low serum osmolarity, look at all of this fluid compared to the small amount of solutes, small amount of chemicals. So same amount in both cups, but this one has a low serum osmolarity because it's dilute. There's a lot of fluid compared to these, the amount of solute in here compared to the high um, where there's the same amount of solutes, but there's a small amount of fluid. So this is much more concentrated. So a higher serum osmolarity. I'm sorry. I beat that down to death, but I feel like it's important to understand some of the other conditions. So no more time wasted on that. Let's actually get into some of the disease and go over them. So SIADH, this is um, syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. So it's a condition in which the body is producing higher 
the normal levels of ADH, which leads the body to retain free water, ultimately leading to hyponatremia. So um, the body is producing all of this excess ADH, so it's hanging on to all of this fluid. All the fluid's coming back into the body. Nothing's coming out in the urine or a very small amount. Um, and the way I remember, because the, the difference between SIADH and diabetes insipidus is SIADH has a large amount of ADH, whereas diabetes insipidus has a small amount of ADH, or it's not responding to the ADH. So the way I remember which has which is SIADH, I take the first two letters, SI, significantly increased ADH. That's how I remember in SIADH, the ADH is higher. And if you remember what ADH does, these will make a lot more sense and the diseases are not hard to figure out what's going on in the body. So SIADH significantly increased ADH. It's a higher level of ADH. Um, so what are some of the causes? Well, the most common cause is going to be some kind of um, something going on in the head. The most common of all of these is going to be a subarachnoid hemorrhage, um, but you can have other CNS problems like a CVA, head trauma. Remember, the um, the ADH is coming from the pituitary, so you have problems in the brain, in the, the tissue, there's a trauma, whatever it is, you can essentially mess up the pituitary function. And again, the most common of these is going to be a subarachnoid hemorrhage, but remember the other ones as well, because these are all very common causes. So another cause is actually small cell lung cancer, and that doesn't really make sense with what we just, just went over, but the reason behind that is because um, small cell lung cancers the malignant cells um, can actually produce um, ectopic ADH. So these malignant cells in the lung cancer can actually come as a source of this uh, ADH. They secrete ADH. So you can have SIADH from someone who has lung cancer. So remember that as well, because that could certainly be a tricky vignette if you had that um, in a question. So small cell lung cancer, these cells can produce ADH um, ectopically. So another cause is uh, anticonvulsants like carbamazepine in particular, and then also uh, hydrochlorothiazide and some antidepressants, SSRIs, TCAs can also produce this as well. So remember those two. The big ones here though are the, uh, the CNS problems and then also the small cell lung cancer. Those are important. So how is this patient going to present? It all depends on the level of severity, but they may have some altered mental status. Um, if it's really severe, they may have, they may be in a comatose state. They may have seizures, um, all relating back to the uh, the hyponatremia and the cerebral edema that they may be experiencing. Because remember, all of this fluid isn't leaving the body, so it's building up. They may have cerebral edema, so it can it can range anywhere from mild to very severe. Um, and then moving on to the diagnosis, these patients are going, going to be normal volemic hypotonic hyponatremia. That's how the uh, the labs are going to be. So what do all of these mean? They all sound pretty similar, but so normal volemic is just going to be as far as their presentation. Do they appear volume overloaded? Is there edema? You know, all of this fluid and swelling? No, they're going to appear normal. You're not going to see anything like that. They're not going to have all of this fluid on the legs and things like that. They're going to be normal volemic. Um, hypotonic, because they're going to have a low solute concentration. And then hyponatremia. Um, because the excess water relative to the sodium is, again, watering it down, so they're going to have hyponatremia. Some of the more important things is going to be the, uh, the serum osmolarity. So you're going to have a decreased serum osmolarity. And if we remember back to the explanation I did at the beginning, it'll make sense because ADH is pulling all of the fluid back into the body, into the serum, not into the urine. So you have increased fluid in the serum because ADH is pulling it back in. So remember, it's opposite the serum osmolarity. So you have this dilute serum. So you have decreased serum osmolarity because ADH pulled everything back. Now, if you have decreased serum osmolarity, what should happen to the urine? Well, if you're pulling everything back into the body, little is coming out in the urine, meaning you have this concentrated urine. So you're going to have an increased urine osmolarity. So solutes compared to the amount of fluids coming out in the urine, it's going to be increased. Remember that. Um, and then you also may have increased ADH levels, which of course makes uh, makes sense. Um, and in the urine, you should remember the um, it, it's going to be very concentrated and it may be anywhere from 20 to 40 mil equivalents. So remember that too, because that may be asking a question or just reference that way that they tested the urine. It was 40 mil equivalents and you should know thinking back to um, SIADH. So remember that too. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so treatment, in most cases, you're just going to treat the underlying cause, whatever it may be, if it's related to a medication, um, if it's related to 
CVA, subarachnoid hemorrhage, treat this underlying cause, and then breaking it down as far as symptoms. If this is a mild patient, mild presentation, you can just, you know, restrict the water intake so their body's not absorbing all of that back into them. Um, if it's a moderate uh, patient, you know, the symptoms are getting a little bit more progressive. You can use something called uh, tolvaptan is one of the medications in, the, in this class, and it's a vasopressin or an ADH receptor antagonist, so it's blocking the effect of ADH in the body, and one of the names of the medications is tolvaptan. If you have a really severe patient, um, you can use IV hypertonic saline to get that hyponatremic state back to normal. And you can also use furosemide. Remember, furosemide is a loop diuretic, so it's going to increase the excretion of free water out of the body. Um, in chronic cases, there is something called uh, demiclocycline, and this is actually a tetracycline derivative. Um, the exact MOA is kind of unclear. But the way it's thought to work is it induces nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, so the opposite of this. And it does this by inhibiting ADH, the effect of ADH on the kidneys. Um, so that's kind of how that works. It's interesting to note that before um, demiclocycline was around, they used to use lithium, which obviously has a lot more side effects, isn't really used anymore. But um, lithium was used as well before this medication came around. But now they use, do use this. It's a lot better tolerated, and it's just a tetracycline derivative. It's actually just an antibiotic that they use for acne and different things like that, but it helps in this situation. Um, so those are the treatments for SIADH. Let's move on to the opposite end of the spectrum, diabetes insipidus. So in SIADH, we had too much ADH, too much of the effect on the body. Diabetes insipidus is going to be the opposite end. So diabetes insipidus, there's a different couple different causes, but it's going to be um, the kidneys are unable to concentrate or absorb water due to decreased levels of ADH, so less ADH, or the kidneys, the ADH levels are fine, but the kidneys stop responding to ADH. All of this leads to large volumes of dilute urine being passed, um, and that's that's those are the different causes of diabetes insipidus. So let's break down the two different types. Um, the first type is the most common, and it's central diabetes insipidus. Um, so for some reason, the pituitary is not, not releasing ADH. Um, in some cases, this is idiopathic. Other times, it can be caused by an injury to the pituitary, destruction, um, ischemia, whatever it may be, um, some kind of problem with the pituitary gland. Also, head trauma can cause this as well. But this is the most common type, and this is going to be where the ADH production is decreased. The body's not releasing ADH anymore, um, so it can't have its effect on the kidneys. The other type is called nephrogenic, not as common. And this is when ADH is being produced just fine by the pituitary. It's coming out, being released as it, as it normally should, but the kidneys are not having it. They're not responding to the hormone, and they're not... Um, you know, they're not hanging onto the water like they should. They're just ignoring the ADH that's being produced. So those are the two different types. Um, as far as the causes of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, remember lithium. Do not forget this. Again, I talked about it before. Lithium actually used to uh, treat SIADH because it can induce diabetes insipidus, kind of throwing it back in the opposite direction. Maybe not the best treatment, but I guess in the right doses, you titrate it the right way. Maybe you can find an equal balance. But remember, lithium can definitely cause diabetes insipidus. Um, that's a really big one. And then uh, electrolyte imbalances as well, like hypokalemia, hypercalcemia can also cause this. Um, so those are important to remember. And um, those electrolyte abnormalities actually happen because when your body is deficient in these electrolytes, the kidney kind of ignores the ADH, uh, decreases its response to vasopressin. So that's the reason behind that. Um, as far as remembering diabetes insipidus, remembering central and nephrogenic compared to SIADH. Remember SIADH, we remember it SI stands for significantly increased. Diabetes insipidus, we remember by remembering the first three letters of diabetes insipidus. So DIA. Central, you'll remember decrease in ADH. DIA stands for decrease in ADH. And then for nephrogenic, DIA stands for decrease in acknowledgement because the kidneys are no longer acknowledging ADH, the presence of ADH. So remember DIA, diabetes insipidus, decrease in ADH or decrease in acknowledgement. And those are the two ways to remember that diabetes insipidus is decreased. Um, so remember that. And let's move on to the uh, the presentation of this patient. The main thing is that these patients are going to be drinking and peeing like crazy. So polyuria, polydipsia, because they're drinking, because they're dehydrated, but the body's not hanging on to any of the water, so they're never fixing the problem. It's kind of like they're drinking and they just have a hole in the other end and it's just all flowing out. Um, they're not 
bringing back any of that water so they're dehydrated and then the kidneys aren't responding to ADH they're just peeing it right out so that's the main presentation if it's if they're really severe they may have some altered mental status from the uh, the hypernatremia um, <clears throat> on physical exam you might see dry mucous membranes they may be hypotensive because remember they're volume depleted at this point uh, going on to the diagnosis you're going to see the opposite of what we saw in SIADH so increased serum osmolarity and decreased urine osmolarity so remember we're not hanging on to any fluid so you're going to have a very um, concentrated serum because the fluid's not being brought back into the serum back into the body so remember opposite of where the fluid is so we're gonna have an increased serum osmolarity and the urine in the other hand all of the water is going out into the urine it's not hanging into the body so all of the the the, the urine is very dilute so the ser the urine osmolarity is actually going to be decreased because you have a high level of volume compared to the amount of solute amount of uh, chemicals in the urine so remember it's going to be the opposite of SIADH um, the ways you can actually diagnose this a little, you know, moving on is something called a fluid deprivation test. And what you do is you deprive the patient of fluids for about eight hours. Now, I'm sure you all have forgotten to drink for a couple hours and, you know, all of a sudden you pee and your, your pee is very concentrated, very yellow or orange. You know, we've all been there and then we realize, okay, crap, I haven't drank in a while. Let me go drink some water because I'm getting dehydrated. So in a normal patient, that's what's going to happen. Somebody's not going to drink fluids for eight hours. Their urine is going to be extremely concentrated. But in a diabetes insipidus patient, their urine is going to continue to remain dilute, um, less than 300 milliosmoles. So remember that. That's an important one. It's an easy test to do. You're just going to have the patient not drink anything um, for eight hours. And then if the urine does not become concentrated like it should in a normal patient, this is going to start the, the diagnosis of diabetes insipidus. Um, then once you have the diagnosis, you want to go ahead and differentiate. Is this central or is this nephrogenic? So the way that you do this um, is you give the patient something called desmopressin, which is um, a synthetic form of ADH. And if the patient has central diabetes insipidus, what do you think would happen? Well, in central diabetes insipidus, we remember the pituitary is not producing ADH. So you give this patient ADH, everything should go back to normal. The urine output is going to reduce. Um, it's going to become more concentrated. You're no longer going to have this dilute urine. Everything's going to be back to normal. Everything is going to be good. Now you give it to a nephrogenic diabetes insipidus patient. Remember, the kidneys do not respond to ADH, so it doesn't matter if you give them desmopressin, nothing's going to change, it's going to remain exactly the same. So this is how you differentiate the two, by giving them ADH. And if they respond, then you know it's a central cause and they're just not getting enough ADH. And if they don't respond, then you know that this is going to be a nephrogenic cause. So that's the way you differentiate between the two. So as far as treatment, central is pretty easy and straightforward because again, they're not getting ADH, give them ADH, desmopressin straightforward easy obviously if there's some underlying cause going on you would fix that but otherwise as far as uh, pharmacological options it's just adh you give them desmopressin um, nephrogenic is going to be basically to treat the underlying cause is this caused by lithium is it an electrolyte imbalance um, fix the underlying cause and then some other medications that you can use as well um, hydrochlorothiazide is one and this works by um, actually causing a mild hypovolemia and it encourages the, the kidneys to start retaining salt and fluids um, if they were taking lithium a medication that you can use as well is something called amiloride and what amiloride does is it prevents um, the entry of lithium into the nephrons and it blocks the sodium channel so the lithium doesn't have the effect on the kidneys anymore so that's something you can give them in the interim as you're fixing the problem and you know discontinuing the lithium just to fix them, fix them in the meantime so those are the options for nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. And then I just wanted to uh, make a quick chart here so we can go over a few of the, the main topics that we went over. We can see things side by side. So SIADH versus diabetes insipidus. SIADH, remember it's an increased ADH production. Remember SI stands for significantly increased ADH. Whereas diabetes insipidus, remember those first three letters, DIA, um, decrease in ADH or decrease in um I can't remember <laughs> some mnemonic, but de decrease in acknowledgement, decrease in acknowledgement. So it's either one of those. So either you're going to have less ADH or the kidneys aren't going to respond to it. SAADH, most common cause is going to be some kind of CNS problem, subarachnoid hemorrhage being the most common. In diabetes insipidus, it's going to be a central uh, cause. So it's going to be the, some type of pituitary injury or something else like that. Um, SIADH is going to have a decreased serum osmolarity. Remember, SIADH, more ADH, more fluid coming back into the serum. 
it's going to be dilute opposite so it's going to be a decreased serum osmolarity because you have a dilute so the serum is not going to be as high um, in, in relation to the the actual fluid um, and then diabetes insipidus opposite increased serum osmolarity and then SIADH increased urine osmolarity remember because it's going to be very concentrated all of the fluids going back into the body but nothing into the urine and then in diabetes insipidus opposite decreased urine osmolarity so I know this was just two topics, but it's a lot. And I remember having some trouble with it in PA school. So I think kind of breaking it down and going over like this should help. You definitely should, you know, look at these things a few times because it can be confusing. And a lot of times you only get like two questions on it. So don't go crazy either. But I think you should know some of the basics so that you don't mess up these these maybe easy questions on the exam. So that's diabetes insipidus versus SIADH. I hope that was helpful. Again, I've been releasing videos pretty much once or twice a week. So I hope this is helping you guys check out my podcast as well on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen. And thank you again for listening. Please let me know what you think. And uh, I'll be releasing another video soon.